one of the things that I learned about you was that you had a phrase that you would say that blocked you, which was, I don't have it. Tell me how that hurt you and how it hurts other actors by holding on to that story. Oh, the I don't have it, meaning I don't have it when I walk in the room. Like I don't have what is it, right? Um, the it factor. I do a whole talk on the it factor, actually, because I think it, you're right. It, it came from that feeling of, I think that, I actually think the vagueness of it hurts actors too which is you have to have it. And some actors have it and some actors don't. And I think I've had, um, I've had actors, I've had teachers say to me, you have it or you don't have it, you know? And, and so what is that it? You know, what, how do you create it? How does somebody who doesn't have it get it? And what is that, that it is when, and I think it's when an actor walks in the room and that they are, or even on stage or on camera or when they perform that they can be so it's focused and um, on, and I say intention, you know, they're focused on this intention um, of what they're saying, what they want the other people to do or say and how to reach and how to communicate what they want to say. But they're so focused in, in that vision of, of their purpose and their voice and their, um, that gives them joy. And then that joy comes through them and we watch that and we want that and we like that. And, it, and to me, I see it in performers and um, singers. Um, you know, I love Luis Miguel and one of the things that I love about watching him is that he just like zones in and you, it's like he gets um, taken over, right? And he's taken over even by a spirit or by this, this muse of music. And it's so, and when I watch great performers, like, and I'm thinking of musicians right now, but even great actors um, get lost in that, just be there that so present and lost in that moment that that's what I think it is. Right. And that, and, and that's enthusiasm. That's, um, their joy, their, their, their passion and they're connected to it. And so for an actor or for a singer, you have to connect to music and, and words, right. And you have to be able to perform that way. And an actor has to take those words, internalize them, let them be their own right and and then have them come out and that when we watch that and that's authentic and that's and that's authentic that that we enjoy that so when i said i didn't have that it i didn't know how to do that with a script and i didn't know how to do that in an audition setting and um, I was joyful and excited and I walked into that audition. It's, it was the ABC audition when I was like 14, 13 or 14. And I walked in and I was like joyous and excited to be auditioning. But then I didn't know what to do when they gave me that script. And so then I get in my head and then I'm up here trying to figure it out and get it right. Get it, is it right? Is it wrong? Am I doing this? Not allowing uh, not being able to be because I didn't know what to do I couldn't be authentically me and then I if I couldn't be authentically me connecting to that script then that that my enthusiasm my joy my it couldn't come through today we are talking to director actor mom wife and just an amazing person I am so excited to have her here it is Lauren E. Chatema. She is amazing. I've been very blessed to see her directorial stuff at, at work and to watch some of her talks on Facebook, uh, talking to actors. And I have to say, you have your finger on the pulse. You, oh. you really know how to speak to actors. You really know how to encourage them, how to give them tools that they need. And that it factor... I think every actor has the it factor. I, I think the problem is that 
sometimes because we are vulnerable as actors, we take the wrong information from people. If, if, if we meet with a casting director or we meet with an agent and they go, well, you know, you don't really have it. It's like, fuck you. I have it. I don't care what you have to say. And I think as actors, we have to own that we have it. Yes, there are some actors that come out and they ooze it. But what I have learned early on is that there are some actors that when you meet them, they are so charismatic. But when they get in front of the camera, the camera hates them, <laughs> hates them. And then there are actors that you meet and they, they're Joe Nobody. But when they get in that in front of that camera, oh my God, they just light up the room. You know, yeah. they just, oh, the, the, the camera eats them up. So for anybody to say to an actor, you don't have it, whether it's your family, whether it's, you know, your next door neighbor or whoever it is, they don't know. And when you show up and you are present and you are centered in who you are and what you are doing and in your intentionality, which is what your company is, intentional acting, it it really makes a difference. You know, um, Michelle Pfeiffer, I remember seeing her on, on um, at a studio one time and she was playing with her, her young child. I don't, know, I don't remember if it was a boy or girl, but she was out there playing with the child and I'm sitting there waiting for uh, to go in to read for something. And I was sitting on the stoops of, of one of the fake streets and I'm just watching her and I'm like, oh my God, she's just having the best time with her kid. So joyful. But it wasn't until later I, I found out it was Michelle Pfeiffer. She did not give off that it factor that is so present when she is on screen. You know, and and I saw that with other people. So I just wanted to um, uh, start off with that because I think sometimes, especially young actors, we're so impressionable. We don't know anything and we are looking for that validation, you know, like me. Am I OK? Do I have it? And so my question to you is, what do you tell young actors, even more seasonal actors who are still in that dilemma of wanting to please people. What is it that you say to them to calm them and put them in their, in their body? That's interesting. Um, I think what, what I, what I usually do with an actor is I lead them through my nine questions of intentional acting, because in those nine questions, you connect to the story and you understand that story. And it really, I've come to discover that it is a somatic experience where you start in your head by understanding the facts. What are the facts? And then you relate to it. How do I relate to this? What's the experience of it? It's just dropping into your body. Why, what's my intention? What I need the other person to do? Why do I need it right now? What am I listening for? And then these keys, I think this is the biggest one, is who's the most important person in the scene? And because when we're stuck in, and then, the, and then the ninth question is, how can I use this scene to heal or benefit myself? So in that process, and so I can pick one of those if I you know, want to work with an actor quickly. Um, and if I had to give one thing, you know, who is the most important person in the scene? We think often when we're in, will you like me? Do you think I'm good enough? Am I this? Am I that? You know, you want me to do that? I have no idea what that meant, but yes, I can do it. You know, just because I want you to like me and take more time with me and all of that, that becomes your strongest intention, which is to get them to like you. And that may not be the right intention for the scene. Or, and also what happens is then you're attention is on yourself and you become the most important person in the scene. And then when I, if I do that right now and I start thinking about me, 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 I'm going to go, wait a minute, what does my hair look like? Is this, I, you know, with my glasses, oh, I look so pale or oh, I, I, I don't want my hair like that. Now I, all my attention comes on to me and then I will get nervous. 
and then I will forget my lines. And now I am nowhere connected to my it factor, right? So when I say, who is the most important person in the scene? The other person. So let me get so focused on Lydia. And am, is she, you know, if, if my intention is to make sure that you understand what I'm saying, that you're getting very clearly, you're going, oh, I get it. And I'm watching you nod your head. Then all my attention goes over there and I get connected to you. And that's where I can get lost in the scene. And honestly, that's like the number one thing that great actors do that creates presence. And Meryl Streep even says that. You know, my, my friend, Zach, he was working on a pilot with Jason Alexander. And, and then he was talking to me. He says, well, tell me about your nine questions. And I went through them and I was talking about who's the most important person in the scene. He was like, oh, Jason said that's what Meryl says. I'm like, what? And he said, Meryl says that she makes the other person the star in the scene, the most important person in the scene. And I bet you that's what Michelle Pfeiffer does. And that's when you stay focused and listening and connected and you forget about yourself. What happens when you have several people in the scene? It's not just you and one person, but you may have two or three people in the scene. Who then becomes the most important person to you? Everybody. Everybody else, you know? If if my brother and I are coming to get my mom to, or we're both coming together to get mom to say, um, yeah, you can go to the movies. I He might not have a word, but he's in the scene with me, right? I still need to make sure, I still have an intention with him. I still need him. You're on my side, right? You're going to back me up. Whatever it comes out of my mouth, you're going to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not going to, you know, I have an intention with him. I have an intention with mom. Mom say yes. Mom say yes. So my attention, attention has to be on both of them. They both have to be the most important person in the scene and to make sure that I'm getting what I need and what I want. So putting all your attention over there. I love these nine steps that you're talking about. When the actor is going through the nine steps, do they work on that first before they start memorizing their lines? How, because... You know, uh, something I see on the internet and it makes me crazy is how to learn your lines. And it's like, wait a minute, you you left out other stuff that's important before you can get to the lines. The lines are secondary. So, so I'm just curious about your steps and how you integrate that with line memorization. Well, what a perfect question. A perfect question because... I say, I'm actually, I just got a publisher, Rutledge, for my book, which is called Stop Memorizing Your Lines, How to Internalize Your Dialogue and uh, Be Ready for Action. That's the book, because I thoroughly believe that. Stop memorizing your lines. Be and these, these nine questions, the reason that they're questions is because the question, what I find found was most actors ask themselves the wrong questions. And when, and one of them for me is who am I? Because that makes me the most important person in the scene, right? So I, the beginning of the first question, what is the scene about? What is the, what are the relationships is, what are the relationships? Because who I am can depend on my relationship. Who I am with you right now is completely different than when my son is in the other room watching a video, playing a video game, and he's supposed to be doing his homework, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right? So exactly. acting is about behaving, right? So the way that this works with line memorization is that they're intertwined. It's like, I do this because it reminds me of DNA, right? That, that, that as you're learning the story and doing your preparation, it adds you and you go through the nine questions you will then memorize your lines the lines will be and actually they're not memorized they're internalized and so and you don't real and memorization like when i first started teaching acting i'm like well, if i'm going to teach acting i have to think of well well how do you how do i teach that right how and and so i was like well what's acting 
And I looked it up in the dictionary. What's acting? And I'm sure you'll get performing or pretending, which I don't, I don't go with those. But the basic one is to do something. So I was like, okay, if acting is to do something, then what are you doing? So all those times that I was given direction, like be the character or you're not connected or you're not this, I'd be like, well, how now the question that I asked over and over and I encourage you actors to ask is, well, how do I do that? Right? And so it's about doing something. So when I get focused on what I'm doing, so then I, oh, I know where I was going. So then I looked up when I was like, well, then what's memorization? Let's look up what to, me how, what's to memorize. And it says to learn by heart. And I go, great, how do you do that? Right? And then to learn by heart led to, to learn by rote. And it was actually in one of my Facebook, um, no, YouTube videos that a scientist responded to me and he said, you're absolutely right about not memorizing lines because the, that's not the way the brain works. It actually works against the brain, um, the brain's natural tendencies, which is learning something by rote over and over and over and over again. It actually works against your natural tendencies to retain and, re and retrieve information because the brain learns things, we learn things in heuristics, in little segments. So we learn, so that's why a phone number, and that connects meaning, right? So a phone number is 818. 818, we all know has a certain meaning. That means you live in the valley in Los Angeles, right? Some people think that's a really cool phone number. Some people don't, right? Or the 808 is Hawaii. So that's a very cool phone number. So we have associations to area codes, but that's how why it's broken up into those three little sections so that we can remember them. But then what happens is we create meaning that go with that, right? So the same thing is if we break down like the beats of a scene, which is what I do after the nine questions. But the nine questions, when you start with what are the relationships, where does it take place? What happened the moment before? What you're doing is you're creating, you're asking yourself questions, which is the first thing to memorizing lines, to memorizing, they'll, they'll say is when you create questions, your brain will instantly create meaning. Okay. And then to get clear on the facts, where does this take place? What are the relationships? What's the conflict? What happened the moment before? Not making that stuff up, but what's the facts of it? And then the next thing you do in the nine questions is relate to it. How do I relate to it? Then you make it personal. So now you're creating more meaning, right? Third is what is the experience of the scene? When you're thinking about what is the experience, what do I see, hear, smell, touch, taste? What do I sense? And when you do that, you're now attaching even more meaning. So it's like taking these words, understanding, re comprehending what they mean and what and built and creating that story, connecting to that story, creating meaning to that story. And if you're doing that all at the same time, you are literally internalizing the story and then the dialogue will follow. Just like you asked me a question, I have no idea what I'm gonna say next. I don't have a script. I haven't written this out, right? And so my brain is going, okay, what's the story? What am I, I'm going to, I'm going to think about what it is you asked me. I'm going to think about the answer and what the story is. And then when I understand the story, the words will follow. And that's what, that's when authenticity is there. That's when we can live in, in that moment and be moment to moment is what actors need. Right. And I mean, that's what acting is. Like the other day I was in class and I had this realization. I was like, oh my gosh, acting is in the details. It's in the details, but you can't, and the details is when, when you live in those, that, that's when you can live in the moment to moment. But if I get so caught up in the details, I'll never get into the moment. But when I'm in the moment, the details will emerge. That's kind that's of good. That's good. I, I, hope the actor, I hope you guys get that because that's sort of. Yeah, no, but that is true. That is true. You have to be in the moment and you also have to keep the tension. Because acting is about drama. It's about it. 
it, you're creating a drama. You want something. And if you get it, then you got to go for something else. That's not good enough. You know, otherwise the scene is over. I always remember uh, my, uh, my teacher, Roy London, saying, okay, if you get it, then it's over. So you have to find something else. That's not good enough. You have to challenge your whatever it was that you said you wanted from that person. Now you have to make the stakes even hotter. Because, right. you know, so it, it there's, um, uh, to me, acting is so complicated and so complex, you know, if especially when it's done right. It looks so simple. It looks so simple. There's something that you say that I um, that I, I wrote down because I, I thought it was uh, wonderful. The power of storytelling to heal. So as an actor, you're using storytelling to heal what? Heal yourself. You know, I think for a long time I was like, how is an actor a storyteller? Uh, because I just think of that a storyteller as a narrator, right? I'm narrating, I'm talking, and then I'm telling a story. Well, as actors, what we do is we get inside the story and we live inside that story, and that's how we're storytellers. And when we're living inside that and we're sharing our experience and bringing breath to it, that's what other people are seeing. How do they bring that into their work? Oh, I think be, um, that's what my ninth question is based on is what, how can I use this scene to benefit me or how to heal me? And so um, the example that I use and the story that I tell is that when I was in graduate school, I was engaged to this man and he was an alcoholic and I was living with him and engaged with him. And I didn't, I didn't know how to get out of the relationship. You know, I wasn't emotionally strong enough. I was trying to, I couldn't figure out how to do this. And, and it wasn't a healthy relationship. And, um, and so what happened is along came a scene from Nora in a doll's house. And I hadn't done my homework and I hadn't, and I probably hadn't done the homework or memorized it because it was too close to home that my resistance was popping up because it was scary and it was a huge, it was eight pages with this huge, the monologue at the end of that, of that play. Um, so I'm talking about a doll's house and um, by uh, Ibsen. And Ibsen, right? And in the monologue at the end of that eight pages is so long. And I think I was probably overwhelmed. And then also was emotionally like overwhelmed. How am I going to get through this? And I, it was a Sunday night and I, and we had to do the scene on Monday and I was like, Oh boy. And I memorized it like this. It just came to me because, and I don't, I don't, I didn't have the intentionality. That's why that's the difference is at that time I could look back and remember this is what happened, but I didn't have the intentionality to choose to do that in advance, you see, but it can't, but, but something emotionally connected to that piece. And it became the voice for me to, to take off the wedding ring, that I, the engagement ring I had on my finger and to, and to have to do that in the scene. Cause that's what she does at the end of the scene, at the end of the play, she takes it out. Sorry, spoiler alert. Uh, take the, take the ring off and hand it over to him. And so when I got up and did the scene the next day, I couldn't get the ring off, kind of like now. And all I could think, the actor part of me is going, my teacher is just going to, that's all they're going to talk about is that, Lauren, you didn't get the ring off. The ring's the most important part. Why didn't you follow through? I just knew that that was going to be it. And I'm like, no way. Uh, no way. I am, and that's where intention came from, right? I'm getting this thing off my finger. <laughs> and we had this, pretend bar, you know, with the liquor bottles with water in them. And I went over in the scene, I dumped water on, I took it off and I handed it to him and I left. And I know, see, it, it, it moves me to even tell, oh, wow. Ooh. It moves me to tell the story because 
I know that that moment in that scene, if I had not taken off that ring in that scene, I would not have been able to do it a month later in real life. And I don't know that I would be here doing this right now. I would be a different person. So it moves me when I share that story, you know, so that scene changed my life. And when we can look at acting and our scene work as an opportunity to heal and say what I need to say versus I have to get it right for you. I have to make you like me. When it can be personally something for me, then it's like mic drop, walk away, you know? And and what's the interesting part of that story is that later I was in Los Angeles, that was back in Rhode Island at Trinity Rep Conservatory. And I was in Los Angeles and I was at this location convention and I met a fellow alumni from Trinity and we started talking about class and teachers. And she was like, oh, Stephen always talks about the scene from a doll's house and this woman and she took this ring and she did this and I was like, yeah. That was me. <laughs> and that was like 10 years <laughs> later, right? So he's still talking about this scene. And it wasn't about getting it right, being great, getting the teacher's approval. It wasn't about any of that. It was about healing me. But it was also about obstacle and how you got past the obstacle. You know, the the... One of the things that I love about acting is that when you do your work and you come prepared, then the magic happens. The Absolutely. ring wouldn't come off. And you instinctively said, let me go get some water because I'm getting this damn ring off of my finger. And those are the, those are the beautiful moments that come out of, yes. uh, out of you know, it, it wasn't planned. It, yeah. it was instinctive. Your instincts kicked in and and that's what makes acting great it's like the lines are secondary it's, it's what you do with what is going on i think that's what even became like my my goal as a teacher and my passion around teaching is that i think that preparation plus opportunity equals success right so preparation is where my job as your teacher is to help you Let's find out what's missing in your preparation. And for me, as I talk to a lot of actors, and I talk to all levels of actors, right? Brand new, brand newbies, little five-year-old kids, all the way up to an 86-year-old who is a TikTok star, right? And seasoned actors, SAG actors, the whole gambit I talk to and I work with, right? But the people that are just memorizing their lines and expecting that magic to flow are frustrated. It's not working. Or it's worked to some point. It got them somewhere, but it's not taking them any further. And so that preparation, like you said, to really be ready to walk on and let the magic happen, that's what I teach. That's what I have the eight keys, the nine questions, the 10 tools of comp to eight keys of script analysis. I said that so quickly, the eight keys of script analysis, the nine questions of intentional acting and the 10 tools of intentional comedy. Okay. And that, and they really have fallen into this step-by-step -step process. That's repeatable that, and, and also for a lot of actors, if you're like me and probably like you, Lily, we like to go check. I did that. I did my homework. <laughs> You know, it's like a checklist too, um, that it, but then it's there for you even in that moment where I can go, wait a minute, what's the relationship? Wait a minute. What do I need the other person to do or say? What's my intention? Oh yeah. That's not going to be a strong enough intention because I'm going to get it too fast. So what's a stronger one, you know, so it's there for you in that moment too. And that's what I think is about being prepared. So, so let me, because uh, uh, I, I want to talk about the, the um, script analysis, but before we get to that, I want to talk about rehearsal because um, I was listening. I mean, I'm a big believer in, in proper rehearsal. And what I find is a lot of actors don't know how to rehearse. Mm -hmm. And this morning 
it just so happens I was scrolling on uh, Instagram and there was a little bitty uh, a shot of, of Robert De Niro and Al Pacino. And Al Pacino was talking about how so many actors don't know how to rehearse and so many that he has come upon in his work. You know, you think of Al Pacino. I mean, if I was opposite Al Pacino, I would be so happy to rehearse with him. I'd want to know, how are you doing that? Let's go. Let's see what you're doing so I can copy it. But but it was interesting to hear him. And and I think today, because of social media and, and uh, YouTubers and all these influencers, that they don't know how to rehearse. They come up it's all about line memorization. Then you have then you have people saying, "Yeah, we're going to teach you how to do the line memorization," but we haven't gotten to uh, learning what it is that you want or rehearsing. You know, do not turn on the camera to do your self tape until you've rehearsed and you've asked those nine questions or twelve questions or whatever. However many I have twelve, so that I okay. that I was taught. So until you have all those questions answered and and have run it through and kind of gotten a sense of who this person is. What do you want? So with that said, do you talk to actors about rehearsals and how to do the rehearsal? Yeah, I do. But most of the time, because we're in Hollywood, and if you did get that opportunity opposite Al Pacino, you wouldn't get any rehearsal. <laughs> but some actors... I mean, I have been on set where some uh, high profile actors have said, I want the set closed. I want to do a rehearsal before we shoot. So it does, you know, you don't you don't get the old time rehearsal time that you used to get, you know, where the actors would come in, you'd be on a sound stage or you'd be in some kind of rehearsal hall and you'd walk through it. And right. you kind of would, the director would give you notes. You may not have that, but sometimes you do have actors who demand that on a film set, not so much on a TV set right. because money is time and they, you better right. know everything you have right. to say. And right. with that, I'll say Mark Ruffalo, uh, I, I saw him uh, do a round table and he said that early on in his career, he got, he got a really good sized part. It was opposite James Farentino. He came on set and he had a long ass monologue that he had to do. Well, he did not know the monologue. And oh, yeah. I don't I don't remember if it was James Farentino or another actor yelled at him and said, You better know your lines when you come on set. Wow. He, said, he was so embarrassed. He never let that happen again. Right. And I think that that's where people go, I got to know my lines, so I've got to be memorized. But it's more than that, right? Like we just talked about. And so I think I spent a lot of time teaching people how to be prepared, how to prepare with no rehearsal. And to me, that's why students know those nine questions. And, and like I can rattle them off to you in less than 30 seconds. And I also believe that they should be so triggering that you can answer. And so that's why I like it to be a repeatable process so that I can repeat it in the moment, in that second that I'm right there, what are the relationships? And that trust and asking them in questions will then trigger your brain, right? And that, that they be succinct in being succinct. Then what happens is when you're think of, I think of it as a, a prism, you know, in a prism, you had a, a prism and you shine a light through it. If you don't shine it in kind of the right angle, nothing, no rainbow comes out. You have to be specific. So when that light shines specifically through a prism, out comes a rainbow. So when you have a specific question and you answer it specifically, the out comes a rainbow even to you and to other people. Okay? So that rehearsal is those nine questions, right? And in rehearse, and if I had time to rehearse with somebody or I was working with an actor, you know, I'd be looking at, okay, now we just ran that scene. Or as you're running the scene, focus on the relationship. Do you really, are you really, is that working for you? Okay, the relationship's working. What about, are you aware of what's going on? Are you, 
I, because how we behave, where we are tells us how we behave, right? I'm in my own office, we are in yours, we can connect. Uh, you know, I can say pretty much anything I want, right? There's nobody out there listening. Last night I was on a Zoom call and I was talking uh, with somebody, we were talking about um, some money and I'd had a money conversation with my husband last week that didn't go so well. So I was like, so I talked to him, you know? And so how I behave at where you are, or if I'm outside, or if I'm in an amphitheater, or if I'm, you know, uh, right. and what I'm talking about, right? So usually what happens, because I was just on set last week shooting with Jig Reel Studios, we were shooting reels for actors. And so this scene, the ner and what the first thing you see is the nerves and the self-consciousness is the first is the first shot. So really, if you're going to come up against Al Pacino, or any of these, any, any name actor, and you're walking on that set, it's like the rehearsing is letting go of all that self-consciousness, you know, and getting so focused over there. And so that you can just go, right? And that's what I realized and it that will also put the 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 crew at ease because we sit there we're watching you go through your first lines and yeah, i'm sure when mark ruffalo had didn't know his lines the whole crew went like oh god <laughs> <laughs> we're going to be here a long time. All day and then the director's going who's the casting director where's that casting director who do they think they are casting this guy does that casting director work again? No. Does that casting director, then that's why they're trying to find the right actors. So that everybody's trying to take care of their butts, right? So that rehearsal is connecting. And that's why it drives me crazy when I hear an actor say that they're using a mirror to rehearse. Because <laughs> I'm like, you guys, if you're using a mirror to rehearse, I just want to say this. What's happening is you're focused on you and you're focused on the results and you're focused on what I look like, what I sound like and what I, what I, what, how I'm moving my body. And then you're only on the results. You're not on the inside of the story and you're not connecting to the other person. So in rehearsal, like, am I really listening? Am I connecting? Am I getting my intention? Am I, am I, is this relationship really feel like how I would behave if this I'm talking to my mom and is this how I would really behave? Does this feel really real to me? Yes. Is my attention on me? No, get it over there. Right? That's what rehearsal's for. Well, I never heard anybody say they rehearsed in front of a mirror. That's a new one. Oh my gosh, I get that all the time. I'm like, ah. Oh. The thing that I would say regarding rehearsal for an actor is that it's the period of discovery. Mm -hmm. It allows you to discover things that are not in the script. Because when you do, when you answer those questions, you then start to go, oh my God, my uncle Tom, he was that, oh my, and he did that. Oh, and it makes me so angry. I hate when he does that. And he like, you know, it's like, Yes. Finding those moments, even if you don't have the actor you're going to work opposite, have some a friend read it with you so you can start uh, looking and, and, you know, instead of going, oh, you're not reading well, take that in. Use that as as fuel for you. Oh, I hate how he does this. But don't don't fuss with that with the person reading. Just take it. It's like, oh, this is good information. I'm gonna learn some stuff here. And if and and something else I, I just want to say about the rehearsal process, when you're on set on a TV show and they're just doing a walkthrough, use that as your rehearsal, even though you can't get out all your lines, when they're marking the spots, you put in, oh, what would my character do in this place? How would they feel with that person holding the door closed? Uh, 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 those are real, those are quick, but they really go into your, your, they really go into your body. If you're, if you're just paying attention, pay attention in the, in the blocking, when you get on set, pay attention. Even if you didn't get a rehearsal, sometimes you can ask the actor to go outside. Hey, do you want to run lines? 
Hey, would you like to? Because that become that becomes your secret rehearsal. Yeah. Instead of ah, what are my lines? You should you you are coming in and going. How how do they move their head? What whatever mannerism they're giving you in the reading of uh, of the lines, you should start taking it all in. So when you go on set, you are full. You are full because it's not about. It's almost like you're going to war. At yeah. least. At least that's how I always tackle. Uh, I, I always tackle acting parts. I'm going to war, that's and cool. I am. I am determined that I will win. You might beat me down, but I'm coming back. And so I think for actors, you have to put that. Um, you have to put the confrontation in there, even if even if it it seems like it's such a minute scene. Like, hey. Hey, Lauren, how you doing? There's so many ways right. to approach. Hey, how you doing? And 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 not, you know, I don't want to say if you just have one line, you know, to go in there and 20 million, but, but at least have an intention for it. You know, that's part of in the question one, like what is the conflict in the scene, right? And what I say is that there, the conflict, 99.9% .9 of scenes have conflict. And if they don't have a conflict, which is two people getting married, happily getting married. And we have those scenes where you see that, right? But what's interesting is if you notice, it's usually the two people getting married are really happy, but somebody in the, <laughs> in the, in the party or something else is there's a conflict, right? They, so there is a conflict usually, but sometimes it's just two people getting married. And then it's about diving into the experience of creating that. But otherwise there's, there's, there's always a conflict. And if it's a one line scene, I've, I've coached people for an hour on one line scenes because it's the same work. What you do for one word or one line is the same work that you do for 10 pages or a full script, right? And so it's still going through those nine questions. And that's usually what happens when actors work with me and they see like, how did you get so deep on one line? Like, how did you, how did you do that? And like, and, and really, do I have to do all those nine questions? Don't I just have to memorize it, say the line, <laughs> show up? And that's usually what they do, but that's not booking the job, right? And it's like, yeah, you can do that work. You can memorize your lines, show up, say one line, and it's going to be real hit or miss. But in, a, in, in this industry, when it's just expanding the number of people who are being submitted for every single role and they're looking where they can, anybody can come from anywhere in the world. There's like 3000 people being submitted for a role. So if you're getting called in for that audition, the chances of you, you know, you're, it, it's, it's about being undeniable. It's not yes. bad good or great. You have to be undeniable. It's also about going back to your word, intentional. You have to be intentional, not only to, to, uh, get those lines, not only to come in with a full character and a full life, but also to see that this is a career. Because a lot of times actors are are uh, what I call low frequency. Mm. It's just about, I just got to get that job. I got to get that job. But they're not looking at, this is a long-term career. It's not just about the job. It's you always coming in of excellence on, on you know, with your self-tape that, you are always undeniable that when you put that camera on and you do your work, they go, oh, my God, Lauren, she hits it out of the park every single time. Right. We can't book her for this, but I'm definitely bringing her in for the next thing. So and, I, the room. and I think that when you as an actor can really look at the big picture because as actors, we are so focused on, I got to get this job. I, there's another job. I got to get this. It's always about the job. It, it's not about career. It's not about, wait a minute, what kind of, going back to your last question, how do you heal yourself? I, I believe that part of that healing is how do I heal other people? And I can't heal other people if I'm always struggling and mm -hmm. being in lack because the job, wanting this job, wanting that, that's all lack. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's so tiny. It's mm -hmm. like, think big, how, you know, that, and that also informs your characters, how, 
you know, will they think big or will they be small thinkers? You well, know, also, if you're healing yourself, just think about, you know, if you are finding a way to grow from every single script, if you're using this to make yourself a healthier person, then you will affect the world in a healthier way. You know, so if I hadn't had that scene and done that work and if all that, and if I'd stayed in that relationship, married him, whatever, I'd probably be divorced, all sorts of things. Right. But if I had never then gone to had my life take me to a place where those, where I created the nine questions, then I wouldn't be giving this to other people, which is helping them heal themselves and the joy and the, and the freedom that I've seen actors get from either not having to memorize lines, either doing scenes and saying something that they've never been able to say to somebody. I've had that, that ninth question has opened up so many doors for so many people. And so because I healed myself, I could heal others. Why is coaching for actors crucial? Oh, okay. I'm, I'm a little different that way. Um, I actually really believe that an actor should be able to book a job without getting coached. If they have a technique and a process and ability and a way to assess their work, because everything moves so fast now. You know, I've had students, I had a, I had a student, Patricia Meitzen, who I'll never forget, she had COVID, she was sick, she got the audition at like 11 o'clock, um, like at 10 or 11 o'clock at night. And her agent was like, so sorry to hit you so late, I just got this. And she was sick with COVID. She said she had every excuse in the book to not do that self-tape, right? And it was due like at 11 o'clock the next morning. She said, because she had these nine questions and she had this step-by-step -step process that she felt geared up and ready and knew what to do. And she said, and I, and, and she said, I felt so excited. I just went down. And I did the work. I went to sleep. I woke up in the morning and went through it. Cause I also provide note sheets. So they go through the note sheets. I could go through it. And she also connected with somebody. I think she connected with somebody in my, in, in my group, right. To have a reader. She read it in the morning and delivered it and watched it back. She could use those same nine questions as an assessment tool to say, yeah, this is, I have the relationship, the, um, the, where it takes place is clear. The intention I think is really strong there. And then she submitted it and she booked the job. Okay. So I believe, I believe, and then I also, for my students who are enrolled in my classes, I, if they have an audition like that, they can send it to me. And if I can, if the timing's right and I can look at it in 10 minutes or less, I don't charge for that. And I might say here, look at this note or this note or go do add, throw this in. Right. Um, but I've also had students who have big Marvel auditions, right. And yeah, get some coaching, get support on these. When you have the time, when you have, but come to the coaching prepared versus this, so many people will show up. And that's why I don't even do like one-off coachings. I like two coachings because they come to me and they're like, I memorized my lines, and especially if it's a little kid. And I'm like, I can't break them of this habit of the way they sound, what, the, what they've done with their arms, where they think this line should be. And now we have an hour and we have their nerves and the excitement of the project. And you put all of that in and it doesn't set you up to succeed. Right? So that's where I get frustrated with the industry of, and, 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 and that's why I'm out to really teach actors like how to fish, you know, they say, teach somebody how to fish. They, you know, they can feed themselves for a lifetime, give them the fish, they feed themselves for a day. And I think a lot of coaching is giving actors fish for a day. And I know for me, I would, if I got coached and then I'm in the audition and I'm just trying to remember, say it like this, do it like that, do it like this. 
versus if I have a technique in that technique. And I think this is where also another thing where acting technique, like what is acting technique, right? Ballet has a technique, right? You, they do, they do the same to every single from Barishnikov, from the top dancer to the, to the five-year-old who's in ballet class. They all learn this bar technique. That bar technique, releves and plies, is what lets them, when they jump, they fly, right? Because that technique is just built into them and it's habitual, right? Piano, any instrument, you have to learn your scales, you have to learn your notes, you're playing, you practice that technique, you practice playing scales. So that when you get this big sonata, you go, blah, 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 right? That's the technique is built into that work. And so for me, I was like, I have a master's degree. What technique do I have? What's my technique? And that's where the nine questions became. And so the having that, to, to know those things, whether it's your like 12 questions, I've heard all these different things, but it's, if you have the ability to break down that script and listen to it and, and do that so that that is there for you when you come to get coached, then we can take you to a much bigger level, right? But just to show up, say, coach me, get me ready in an hour. It rarely can I, can I, can I make that a success? I think that's brilliant. I think, I think it's brilliant um, first of all, that you care enough to tell the students, Hey, we have to do a two off. It's not a one off. You, I want you to start putting it in you. And then when you come back, then we'll really dig deep. I, 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 I think that's great. I think that is, yeah. Cause a lot of actors don't have technique. And so by having them come two times, even, even those that do have technique, if it's something that the actor really wants, mm. they're they're a bundle of nerves. They're like, oh my god, and I don't know, and you know, they're all in their head. So to have have somebody who can bring them back down and kind of calm them and say, okay, let's let's walk through it because you know how to do this. You yeah, know remind how to them. Do this. Yes. So often it's a you know really great coachings are reminding mm -hmm. actors what they already know. Mm -hmm. You can do this. You know that you've got. Mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And then cleaning up. And then the other trick, you said something about, you know, just rehearsals for discovery. But I also remind, want to remind everybody being, you want to discover on camera, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Because once you discover, what I see a lot of actors is they discover something and then they hold onto that and think that's it. Instead of like, no, you've discovered that. Now allow new discoveries. And so that, and that's why if you have your technique and the lines will then just fall because you've internalized them. Now you have space to discover and then allow yourself to discover more. And that's why often as a director, if I'm working on camera, I'm like shooting the rehearsals because often I'm getting stuff. They're discovering stuff for the first time in the rehearsal that I'm like, Ooh, I'm glad I got that. That is why actors should also do a lot of theater so that they get used to that process, right? Because we're in Hollywood, it's all about film and television on camera, and you don't get you don't get to have your character breathe. You don't get to get on a stage every night and 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 discover new things because when you're on when you're on a stage, every night is new. The audience is always new. So right. you have to, you know, uh, you you can't. I, I always look at it like you can't cheat the audience out of their first time. That's it's beautiful. Their, I love that. It's their first time. Don't cheat them. Um, I love don't that. cheat them because you found something and you go, "Oh, this is great." You gotta. You have to process it like yeah. it's your first time. And I learned that through stand up. Yeah. And not so much through acting. I learned it through stand up. And and when you watch the masters going back to the master actors those that have been doing it for years and years and years i love going to either the amundsen or the mark mm -hmm. taper and watching a good piece of theater maybe four days in a row oh, or wow. or or watching it 
you know, if, if they're there for a month going every week, wow. once a week to That's just cool. see what are they doing now? Cause the first time you watch a piece of theater or watch a, a, a movie, you're just learning what it is. And it's not until you watch it the second time or the third time or the fourth time that you start to see these little nuances. Yes. And I'll never forget watching, um, I went to go see Lily Tomlin uh, and I had seen her when she first did um, uh, her her one woman show. Oh, and I thought it was so brilliant. It was, it was in Hollywood and it was like so magical and so amazing. And then I went to see her years later at at the uh i think it was the amundsen or the or the the mark taper one of those two theaters and i saw it and i was like oh my god she's great and then i went back and then i went back and then i went back and what i learned was she's a technician mm. she does the same thing over and over she's got her beats she does her stuff and i and i and i, I have to say i was a little disappointed because mm. She was magical the first time, but the second time I was like, okay, she's going to go there. All right. She did it. And I went to go see Elaine Stritch. I don't know if you ever got a chance to see Elaine I Stritch. I never saw her, but I know. Well, let is. me tell you, this woman was fire, fire. She was almost 80 years old. I went to go see her at the Amundsen. I saw her four times in about a week and a half. Cause it was by the time I found out who she was and it, it the, it was, I didn't have much time. So the Amundsen and the Mark Taper had like day, you know, you get there the day and you pay like 20 bucks or $25. Yeah. And so every time she did it, it was new. It was different. I mean, it was the same piece, but she just owned that stage and owned what she was. And sometimes she was a little smaller in certain moments. And sometimes she was a little bit more grand and sometimes she got emotional in, in at some point but it was always live it was always a live piece of theater it was not you know it wasn't the same thing over and over again and i i so appreciate actors that come and just live in the moment because as audiences we too are usually experiencing it for the first time you know, and when they have a real moment, we feel it, you know, as an actor, when you have a real moment, the audience loves that, you know, it's like stand up when, when, when you go off, if something happens in the room, you know, the waitress drops all the, the, uh, the drinks or somebody yells something out and, and we're now present together as opposed to, I'm not, I'm going to pretend that didn't happen. I'm oh, just going to yeah. keep doing my stuff. And, you know, no matter what's going on. So anyway, I love, I, 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 I just wanted to mention that. Another reason why actors should do theater is because when I made my first film, I had made, I'd done a short film and it was doing really well in Hollywood. It kept going over and over. It was a short play, excuse me. I made my first short film was from a play that I had directed. And there was a series of nine, 18 plays. I directed nine of them. Theater Neo and Surprise was running in this. And then I took these actors and I said, okay, let's make, I'm going to shoot it as a film, as my first film, because now I don't have to worry about the actors. I got all that taken care of and I can focus on the camera. So it was very interesting because then I went back to see the play when I was editing the film. And what happened was, is that I learned that theater is an actor's medium and film is a director's medium. Because if they didn't give me the joke the way I wanted it as a director, I just had to go through the takes and find the shot that worked for me. And then I could get it the way I wanted it to be every single time. And then I would go and sit in the audience and they would do something a little different. I'm like, that's not the way I wanted it, you know? And so, so actors, if you want to breathe and live and enjoy and take two hours just to act, go be, do plays, do theater. And it's, and that will also just in, enliven. I mean, the best actors are theater actors. So I, I want to get into the script analysis because I also think a lot of times actors don't do script analysis. 
mm-hmm. going back to memorizing lines. Mm-hmm. So you have eight keys uh, for script analysis. Can you kind of give us sure. a, a little taste of what that is? Some people think that those nine questions are script analysis. I really think that's how you get into character and into the story. The eight keys um, of script analysis really are, think of it like this. When you do a puzzle, you do a box puzzle, right? You look at the whole box cover and that box cover, you kind of refer to it once in a while, right? While you're working on the puzzle. So think about it like this. When you're getting one page or two pages of an hour long or a two or a film of a script, you're getting one piece of the puzzle, right? But think about it, casting, producers, directors, the network, everybody else has the whole puzzle box. And so they're going, I need that. And so Lydia walks in the room, does she fit? Is she that puzzle piece that's gonna go into that puzzle, right? But it's kind of not fair, it's kind of rigged because the actors are like, but I don't get to see the whole puzzle, right? So that's not fair. And so then actors are like, well, I just have to, you know, be my authentic self, or I'm going to play it like this, or I'm going to make a strong choice, and I'm going to do this. But does that fit into the puzzle? So, and and they're making it harder and harder with less and less information on and more NDAs and all this stuff that it's harder and harder to find to research research your the show and the network and all that, right? But that's to me what script analysis is. And script analysis is like, how can I get as much information about that puzzle so that I can fit into, so I can be the perfect piece or as best as I can get or as much information as I can get. And for me, script analysis also starts with us, right? because and our experience and who we bring to it. So like the first step is trust your gut. And I have a worksheet again where you write down everything that's in your gut because I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but for me, I'll be like, oh, well this definitely, this is a multicam and this is this and this is da 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 da. And I think that, but then I start working on it, I do research, I'm like, but that's on HBO and I'm not really sure. And now I've lost my first gut instincts and I'm so in my head. And then the worst thing that has happened to me is then um, I'm thinking back in my tr- in graduate school and training days, like then getting on stage and doing the project. And they're like, well, you knew it was, didn't you know it was this, this and this? And I was like, oh, yeah, I remember when I first read it. I knew that. But then I lost track of my gut because I got so busy in all these facts. Right. So. Trusting the gut, processing any feelings that come up with this project, because I've seen too many actors lose roles because they're so nervous, they're so excited, they're so worried, they're so, they have so many, I don't, I don't do those, that kind of part. They would never cast me in that. All this stuff, right? So process it, get it out, write it all out. Mm -hmm. And then this affirmation that I'm great at script analysis. I am great at script analysis. I wasn't great 20 years ago, but the big difference is I have these tools. And the second one is I know I am, which will trigger your your brain, your reticular activating system, right? And then you can get into the research, right? Research, and then I talk about script format. Because when I look at a script, I can tell you five things within seconds. And this is what I want all actors to do. How many cameras? How, what the, if it's comedy or drama, if it's television or film, um, what the style of acting is, all those things, you should be able to read the format of a script and pick that up and know that, right? I think page number is crucial. Page number tells you where you are in the story. I know there's a lot of teachers that say page number is not important, but yours, you've done some screenwriting, right, Lydia? Mm-hmm. So as a screenwriter, page number is important. And having done some screenwriting myself, right? Page number is important. And that tells you a lot. And what I noticed as, an, as a director, when I was directing my first feature, that I pick sides from the for the lead actor. 
I picked, they casting said, Lauren, can you pick two sets of sides? I'm like, okay. I picked the beginning of the, sh- of the movie and then I picked the three quarter point. I didn't do that. I did that intuitively, right? And then when I started coaching, working with actors, I would notice this is exactly what they pick because you want to see the actor at the beginning and then you want to see, can they do the all is lost moment? And can they go from, oh, I've just met this guy to I can't stand this guy. I'm going to break up with him. And can I see that journey in that self-tape of those two things, right? So page number is critical and not enough people look at that. And then the last, I think I've gotten through all of them. The last key is the um, why. Like answer, like those, those nagging little things when you're reading a script, you're like, why? I use, I, I use a scene from Everybody Loves Raymond, and I'm like, why does Ray turn down the food? Like, he ordered the food, it came to his house, and now he's saying, oh, no tip for you, I'm not giving you the food. Well, because he's supposed to be on a diet and his wife's in the room. But you only get that if you've read the title. So, like, really getting into the details and it's it's and and that you can then bring together i think script analysis isn't just the the research it's not just research it's more than that it's not just script format but you also then have to bring yourself to that so when you start to marry it from that beginning and then so that then you have the big puzzle piece of what this of what they're or close to it and you go oh I know what this show's like. This show is like Madam Secretary of the Crown, or this is what this is like. Now I know I, I can trust that, use that now as I break down the story with the nine questions. I want to uh, dive a little bit into your background because you have so much experience and so much, uh, not only are you um, a director and an actor and a uh, acting coach or teacher you also are a mother you also have experienced loss as far as wanting to you wanted to act when you were young and you were denied people told you that's not for you do this instead and somewhere along the way you you did the directing and then you went to AFI mm-hmm. you to, to study. You had already gotten your graduate? Yeah, I went to, um, for undergrad, I went to, you know, Anne Bogart, if anybody knows who Anne Bogart is, she's a big, you know, director in the kind of avant-garde kind of world of theater and Suzuki and all that stuff. Well, she was at um, UCSD, UC San Diego when I was there. And I went to her and I said, where should I go to graduate school? And she said, come back to me in three days. And she's incredibly cryptic. And I was like, okay. And I came back in three days. And she said, you're going to Trinity Rep Conservatory at Trinity Repertory Theater, which then I thought I'm going to Rhode Island. I'm going to the complete opposite end of the country. Am I in the smallest? What's the point? But it turned out it was the greatest thing in the world. And it turned out Viola Davis was there. We had just missed each other. And then I also was there with um, Richard Jenkins, you know, and it was an incredible opportunity. So I studied acting and directing there, right? But I was mostly there as a director, but I had to do everything that the actors did. And I was also trained as a dancer since I was a kid. So I ballet, jazz, modern. I was trained as a musician. I played the piano for 12 years. So that's where I think I get this strong sense of technique. So Trinity Rep is where I got my um, master's degree. And then I came out to LA to direct, to really direct. And it was, um, it was, you know, 20 years ago, it was a hard time to break in as a woman. It's still a hard time to break in as a woman. And I wasn't able to break in. And at the same time, I got married and was raising my child. But before that, right, I, I got on to, I applied to the AFI Directing Workshop for Women. And that's a special program. We only accept eight women a year. And uh, it's a great program. And that's where I made my first film. And that's where I made Surprise. And then from there, I started to, I was trying to break into Episodic. 
Um, and I started to make a film. I made another film, Cries from Roma. Then we went through adoption process. And I, and somebody said, do you know, do you, you know, why don't you teach actors? You're so good with actors. Why don't you te teach acting? And I was like, oh, there's too many of those. I have so many teachers. Go learn from somebody else. But they said, but when you say it, it makes sense to them. You know, so I'm only looking for actors who, when I say it, it makes sense to them. Because Roy London made sense to you. Ivana Chubbuck makes sense to somebody else. It's like, what? It, we're all saying the same thing. Right. Hopefully. Right. Right? right. Having a coach or an acting teacher is a marriage. And you want to feel safe with them, whoever yeah. it is, whoever. Yeah. I, I mean, I've studied with all kinds of teachers from Stella Adler to Jose Quintero. I studied with all right. these people. And one of the things that I've learned over the years is I studied with those particular people because I felt safe in their presence. I felt like they would take care of me in that acting teacher. You give them permission to open you up. Mm. So you want to feel protected when they're opening you up. You know, it, it, okay. it's like a therapist. If you go to the wrong therapist, they're going to jack you up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. It's, it's totally marriage. It's finding the right people, you know. So I was always, you know, my dance background, my music background, you know, that's why I think I love movies like Moulin Rouge and dream of making a movie like that, you know. Um, because it incorporates everything? Everything, music and dance and story and brilliant camera work, you know, I just think that's a brilliant piece of work, you know, and, um, and, you know, and then I made a pilot for a kid's show. And that was really interesting when I directed that because it married my theater work and my film work, because it was more of a three, a multi-camera kind of shoot. And, and it was, and so I had to incorporate all my, these different skills. So, yeah, I've done a lot of different things. <laughs> what did you learn in AFI? Because you had already gotten your training. You you, well, you were already fully equipped, is what I'm trying to say. You were already I wasn't there. What did you with camera? That's okay. what I learned. I didn't know that's why I picked a play that I had already directed and I was successful and I used the same actors and I had successfully told a story that I knew would work. So that then when I got to the AFI, they taught me, it was my, and that's what it originally was, was to give women their first shot in, in television and camera, on camera. I didn't know what a camera could do. I didn't know that about lenses. I didn't know about, you know, how to use a camera to tell a story, right? And that's what I had to learn by doing it. But having the direction of, of, you know, AFI and all the teachers that go with that. I think that's amazing. I, I, I hear you sometimes um, uh, speaking. And what I want to say to you is you are so much greater than you think you are. Oh, God. You are so much more. Um, uh, I had the pleasure to everybody who's watching to see Lauren uh, direct a play that my friend Ruthie Otero did and wrote and it was the direction was delicious it was brilliant uh, first of all ruthie is an amazing actress amazing. to begin with funny but what but what you brought to the piece was so it elevated it to broadway status i i mean i saw it a couple of times and every time you know and both times that i saw it i was like oh my god this is delicious i it, so you know actors do great work but the director really shines the light and gives uh clarity and and kind of smooths out the beats and and you know and and gets the actor out of their way and so just seeing the work you did in that piece uh, really impressed me. And I just want you to know that I think you are amazing. And the fact that you're a woman makes you even better because you, and a mom, it gives you the sensibility that 
male directors don't have. And I love, I'm, I'm nothing, I love male directors. I love all directors, but, <laughs> but there is, there is a sensitivity that you bring to it that a man isn't necessarily looking at, you know, especially comedy. They're looking at, okay, how are we going to get the, the jokes? How, you know, a slapstick, how are we going to get there? But you, you bring the humanity in a different way. And so I, I just, I, I'm just in awe of your, of your work. I just think you, you are so gifted and you really need to own it, girl. You need to own it a little bit more right. and just know that, uh, you know, film and television is still available to you. Cause I'm a big believer in, uh, visualization and affirmations and how we speak to things is how they they manifest and mm -hmm. and when we keep saying that story that that victimy story it it um it does us a disservice as artists you know i i am a, i'm a fighter and so i did not grow up on the right side of the tracks but anybody who told me I couldn't do something, it was on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it wasn't about being told I couldn't. It was having oppor it was having Right. And you create but but you you get you you have to make your own situation. Oh yeah. And yeah. I think yeah. what happened, but also what happened is that I was raising uh, you know, we adopted a child and raising a child and um, and, and I'm really grateful for that choice that I was like, I need to be home with my child. And I needed to, um, I knew another director and she had been, and she was gone all the time. And I'm so grateful that, you know, the, the gift of this coaching was it had opened my opportunities. And I mean, and the coolest things I'd have parents. And I remember this one nurse, she was a nurse and, um, she was an ICU nurse for babies and I had this baby and he <laughs> and she'd say, I'll go take care of the baby. You coached my kid, you know, and there were just plenty of times when my kid's play thing was right down here while I'm coaching or working. And, you know, that was, that was this choice that this period of my time in my life was to, to be my, to be a mom. And I'm grateful that I could still do what I love to do. And, um, and I've been given, you know, and now, uh, you know, now that with this opportunity to write the book and, and to get published, that's my focus. And, you know, my son's in high school. So you're right. Television and film are around the corner. And that's right. I was actually talking to somebody about a film project yesterday. So that's right. And I think it's important for people who are watching this to know that you never miss your opportunity. Sometimes as artists, we think we missed it. But mm -hmm. opportunity comes if we are diligent and we keep focused on what we want, it's going to happen. It's not always in our timing, right. but it happens. Yes. And it's, it's opening yourself up to say, I'm ready universe. I'm ready. God, bring it on. I'm ready. I'm ready. Bring it, bring it, bring it. And you know, you know what? And you can't second guess that timing because no. what I can tell you is like who I am as a person and the confidence and the confidence in my work as working with actors and the confidence because to be a director on set and that confidence and that ownership and yes you know that i've grown so much in that area and um i think that when i get on set again in a movie or tv that i will I have so much more to offer because yes and, and you will not take guff from anybody because you'll be the <laughs> boss and that's you know and that that's as a director you're the boss you have to you have to be able to stand toe to toe with with the uh, the crew and say this is how we're doing it because otherwise the lead actor will commandeer the the project or the assistant director will commandeer the project and i've seen it done to women uh more than once on on professional shoots on a tv on a big tv show where you had a woman you know you talk about the director being the the it's a director's medium film but tv is really a writer's medium 
And, you know, the writer is the producer. king on TV. Yeah, the writer producer is the king on TV. Exactly. And I've seen, uh, uh, I'll, I'll say TV because I didn't, I haven't had that experience in film, but in TV, I've seen women come on to direct a piece and they just commandeer the the show from her no respect no you yeah. know i've seen the lead actors just take over that's not what we're not doing that that's not how we're doing it and no no re, no respect no hey uh, maybe let's do yeah. it this way but i mean just cut the woman down to size and i uh, that is one thing that i've learned is that as a woman you got to come with your big guns and just say this is my set for this week or these 10 days or however way we're, we're doing it. I'm in charge. Thank you. You, you got something. We, we go to the side and talk, but you do not do that in front of me. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's, it's that. And there's, there's more, there's more where then when a woman does speak like that, she doesn't get a second job, but that's okay. She'll get it another way. I think when I think as I think we are in such a better place as oh. women, Oh, yeah. Than we were, you know, 20 years ago. We're in such a better place. And when we speak up in 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 love, but in firmness, like a good mother, yeah. right? A right. good mother say, I know you want that toy, honey, but it is <laughs> it's not gonna happen today. Exactly. We will revisit it next week and see where we are, but it's not going to happen today. And I think that's <laughs> you know, it's just coming and saying, I, I want this to be as good as you do, maybe even better mm -hmm. because my, my reputation is writing on this. Exactly. So I need you to trust me here and know that I have done all my work. I've, I, I've, I'm ready. I'm ready. Lydia, when are you going to direct? Uh, maybe in like five years right now, my goal is to get my show back on out in the universe and to just uh, do my one person show. That's, that's my goal for this year. But, awesome. Yeah, but I I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for loving on these students and and even though you had to detour that this was where you were supposed to be for a time such as this. Yeah. And and how beautiful it is that you are imparting to these actors, no matter what their age is, you're imparting something that they will be able to carry on and share with other people. Uh, I'll, I'll share this real quick about uh, pouring into mm. things and you don't realize that it pours into other, mm. it, it pours into others. Uh, so I was a um, serial plant killer. <laughs> it doesn't look like it. Yeah, I was a serial plant killer girl. And so one morning I woke up, I said, that's enough. I'm going to, I am going to learn how to take care of plants. I'm, they're not going to die when they see me. They're not going to just check out and go, that's it. She's here. Oh, I'm gone. And so I went to a, um, to a little hardware store and I bought seeds. I bought some soil. So I started with nasturtiums. I, I planted my little nasturtiums because nasturtiums and pumpkin seed grow quickly. I mean, sunflower seeds, they go, they grow quickly. Yeah. And pumpkin seeds too. So I planted the nasturtiums. I put it out in my balcony. I said, I need to see, I need to see fruit in my life. So I put the nasturtiums out. I watered it. I would water it every day. And about maybe a month, month and a half later, all of a sudden there's flowers popping out. I'm like, oh my God, things are happening. But I, then I saw flowers coming from under the plant. I was like, that's kind of odd. <laughs> well, what I didn't know was uh, with, with the pot, you have to put a little dish to catch the water. Right. Well, the water was going into the remaining seeds that I had not planted. Oh, so funny. they grew they grew through the little envelope and they had come out just like the ones that were in the soil. And I remember standing there and that, and, and, and for me, gardening has been a very spiritual thing. God speaks through, uh, through the gardening to me. And he said, see, when you plant, when you plant and water and you continue to water, you don't realize that that water is going to other people. You might've focused on that, particular plant 
but it's watering other things. And so you as a acting coach right now, you are not only watering your students, but they will go off and water other people. They will share those tools that you have given them and it will continue to grow and blossom. And, and you'll meet somebody maybe five years from now and say, oh my God, so-and-so gave me your technique. And, and, and when the book comes out, then it will be mega, mega bigger, you know? So I just want to say thank you, Lauren. This has been so fun. And I say to all you actors who are in the LA area and you need a really great coach, um, you, I'll put the description in uh, all of Lauren's information in the description so you can uh, reach out to her because it is important that as actors, we have the proper training. And sometimes having a great coach makes all the difference in the world. And don't get it twisted. Those lead actors, those big movie stars, the George Clooney, the uh, uh, Viola Davis, all of them have coaches. They do not, it, it does not happen on their own. They have coaches. They have people they trust to get them to where they want to go. Charlize Theron won her uh, award award for Monster because she had Ivana Chubbuck. Uh, um, Michael Clark Duncan, who was in the Green Mile, won his award because he had Larry Moss. Every great actor has a coach. They may not talk about him, but they have them. So I say, check out Lauren, check her out on Facebook. She gives weekly uh tips and classes. And you also work with Wendy Wright. Wendy uh, Allen Wright, yeah. Wendy, Wright. Wendy Allen Wright. Yeah. So for those of you that are on in TMFA, Wendy's- On TMFA. TMFA, those of you who know about TMFA, check out Lauren through that as well. So I wish you all big awards, big careers, and big love. Until next time.